Hello and welcome to the Faith Focus Ministry Podcast. I'm Brother Curtis. I'm Brother Brock. And we're glad to have you back uh, for another podcast. Uh, We had a great time last time as we uh, looked into the Word and began to just share our hearts about what God had given us. Um, We're doing a series uh, that is uh, centered around new year and new year's resolutions i'm sure we're well into the new year i'm sure you either have been successful in your uh, new year's resolution or you have failed miserably (laughs) but whatever the case is this uh series is called new year irony and our first podcast was uh called comfort killing and when we when we spoke last week we uh looked at some things but we began to look at uh, the habitual activities that we as human tend to exhibit so I just want to remind our viewers that the the purpose of this podcast is to inform educate enlighten and empower to develop a love for God's Word Mm. to make it approachable to take away the intimidation factor, Mm. to bring clarity and understanding of God's word, to develop develop disciples uh, one podcast at a time, to develop disciples of Christ one podcast at a time. And so we wanna wanna make this, we wanna make this a sincere attempt to reconnect those who for whatever reason become discontented with church would have become discontented maybe not with church but those who demonstrate or are vessels of God Mm. Um, we don't want to throw stones at those people per se but we want to let people know that there is still hope alive that you don't want to give up on God because somebody did a poor job representing him yes because truth be told we all fail miserable Yes. And fell miserably, as I should say. And the word said we all fall short of his glory. And so let us not be uh, so quick to uh, turn away from Christ because we had a, a bad encounter. So with that said, uh, last we spoke, Brother Brock, we, we got into this word and mm-hmm. we began to talk about the scripture we found in um Romans 11, 7 through 10, where Paul began to talk to the Israelites about their rejection of Christ. And as a result of their rejection, the Gentiles would be engrafted in. Right. And before we got to the place where Paul began to talk to the Gentiles, he told the Israelites that their tables will become a, a snare and a stumbling block. The, the word said God would give them a, a spirit of stupor. Yes. And I began to explain that God showed me that 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 scripture where he talked about the table becoming a, uh, a snare and a stumbling block. It, it stuck out to me and he began to uh, connect that to our relationship with food and how we make these new year resolutions. And they're usually centered around weight and weight loss. And, and I wanted to uh, bring attention to what I thought was very important. And that is our relationship with food and our, um, food addiction. Mm. And, uh, and last, last episode, I just drew the parallel of, you know, if I was addicted to drugs, alcohol, or uh, any uh, controlled substance, that you know, society tends to look at me a certain way. But we never really talk about food addiction and our misuse and abuse of food. And simply put, if you don't understand why you uh, why the purpose of something or why you're using it, you you're, you're bound to abuse it. And that's so true with food. And so we abuse food because we take it beyond what it was originally intended. And that was to satisfy hunger and to provide nourishment. It's become much more than that. And we gave some definitions that I wanted to go over. We talked about habitual. 
and we said the word habitual is done or doing consistently or as a habit. Yes. And then we talked about irony because remember the 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 series is called New Year Irony. And there's three type types of irony. We we forgot to say this in our last episode. Three types of irony. First being situational, the other being verbal and the last one dramatic. For the show's purposes, we focused on situational. And we gave the definition of irony as irony is the figurative term for the disconnect between what appears to happen and what is apparently being said and actually true or reality. Mm-hmm. And so all of this is, is, is important for us to give this backdrop because I really believe uh, it has to be noted and pointed out that when we use food incorrectly and we begin to overeat, we become, we fall into this, this other word, gluttony, mm-hmm. which is a sin. Mm-hmm. And we said the, def- the definition for gluttony was habitual greed or excess in eating. And I asked the question, what makes gluttony a sin? And it's the lack of self-control. Mm. All of this revision and reviewing is important because as we overeat and overindulge, we become obese. The next time you go to church, the next time you're out, just look at how many people are obese in our community. And if you look at it from a, a, a standpoint of what I just pointed out, some people, not all, because I made this clear, some people that are overweight are not overweight because of eating. Some of it is a medical condition. Um, but those who are overweight from eating, they've gotten that way through a lack of self-control. Food has become comfort to them. Yes, It's in a place where God should be. That's why we call this, this series, this particular last series or the last... Uh, episode comfort killing Mm. because the enemy is satisfying you to your own detriment and we said that was called distraction through satisfaction and so you look around in society we have a lot of obese people and the enemy has been successful in getting people to use themselves as an instrument against themselves Mm. And so now you have a person mindlessly eating. And here's, here's the, the big problem. We have diabetes. We have hypertension. We have cancers. And I may mention, I think the food is what's making everybody sick. And so if we had the self-control needed, the food could make us sick because we, we, we would use it properly. And we wouldn't overindulge we wouldn't be obese but because we have the food in the place where god should be we now fall into what paul said your table has now become a snare a trap and a stumbling block Mm. something that would normally bring you comfort has is now killing you Mm. and so i give that revision or that review to go into our next episode but before doing so i want to give brother brock an opportunity to speak about what we've already said um if he wanted to add anything to it um because surely we have covered a lot in the last episode and time moves fast and i don't want to miss anything um with regards to any thoughts that this man of god has you know really just Honestly, looking back at the scripture, and I think it was in, uh, looks like it's in verse 9 with David, but Paul's quoting David, made their table become a stumbling, become a snare, I'm trying to trap for them. And it's interesting when you look at the scripture in the context, that it was, it sounded like it was designed to be a curse. It was designed to be, it was called by David out 
to be a stumbling block for those that opposed him or the work that God called him to do. So the thing that the man of God was pleading God to use as a stumbling block, as an impedance towards the progress and strength of his enemies, uh, we're speaking of today, is us volunteering for such a thing. And I don't know who it is who originally stated, but I credit Dr. Miles Monroe, who to me famously says, when the purpose of a thing is not understood, abuse is inevitable. I think it's interesting, you know, this conversation, whether it be food or whatever else in our lives, we can hold a pull value from. If we aren't clear on what the intended purpose of a thing is, then the abuse of that thing is just about inevitable. And in this instance, our desire for comfort, which is not an evil thing at all, a desire for nourishment, not an evil thing at all, but the comfort that we seek, which God wants to be for us, as stated in the title, our comfort is killing us. And so with that saying, with that said, there is hope, brothers and sisters. And I, I want to I want to reemphasize to you guys that it's so important that we know that we are never without hope. And so now we want to move into the second phase. So we've identified that the table for many of us have become a stumbling block because we're mindlessly eating. And so we want to make a transition from, okay, I want to be, I want to have a awareness of mm -hmm. what I'm doing. I want to be aware. I want to be an active participant in my, um, my change. That was the whole purpose of the new year resolution. You, mm -hmm. you wanted to resolve to do something different. But if you don't pay attention to your movements, behaviors, and habits, you're going to make a new declaration out your mouth with old habits. Yes. And so it's equivalent to walking in a circle, hoping for a straight line. We call that insanity. Mm. And so part two of this series is called the process of an old thing becoming new. The process of an old thing becoming new. It doesn't matter if I have new wine and get ready to pour it into old wine skins. The Bible tells me that's not good. It's the, that, it's that new wine going to burst them old wine skins. I have to be made new and it has to start from the inside out. Your inlook affects your outlook and your outlook affects your outcome. Mm -hmm. And so brother Brock, would you get for me? Second Corinthians five and seven chapter five, verse 17. It's going to be our foundational scripture. And we're going to look at this process of an old thing becoming new. And I'm going to suggest a few things for you. And I'm going to have, you're going to have a lot of homework listening to this podcast because I really want you to get familiar with your word. I want you to say, this is what Brother Curtis said. I want you to be able to look in your word and see what God said. I'm not the authority here. God is, and we all must yield to his authority. So with that said, Brother Brock, 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. I'm going to read it from the New Living Translation. I like the way it uh, spells it out. Verse 17, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Hmm. So the process, let me start right there. I'm suggesting instead of the Christian making New Year's resolutions, that you just submit to the process of walking with Christ which would totally alleviate the need for making a new year resolution. If the word is true, old things are going to become new anyway. Mm. There's no need for you to do it, it, it just, just to be doing it because if you're in true fellowship and you're walking with him, you're going to change anyway. Nothing can stay the same as they journey with Christ. If you if you look the same way you did when you first got saved, you're not doing something right. 
You're not in true fellowship with the Lord because it's nothing has ever come in his presence and stayed the same. Mm. And so there's no need for a New Year's resolution unless you're just out with your friends and you're having fun and you're just in the moment. But people sincerely make these with the attempt of trying to be or become new. With that said, the first thing in this process to, is to understand it's just that, a process. Yes. And that it's going to take time. If you're trying to lose weight, if you're trying to break habits, if you're trying to get away from old things, you're going to first have to know that it's a process and identify the behaviors, the people, the places, the things that you're going to have to change in order to be successful in this process. And so you, me, we're that old thing. That old thing represents flesh. It represents carnality. It represents what we've learned in the earth. The new thing is Christ. It's spirit. Let me say this, and this is for free. I won't charge you for this. <laughs> the kingdom is not material. So you'll never hear on this show that if you just jump up 10 times, we're going to give you, God's going to bless you with a, we, we're not going to tell you that. Now, we we do not preach against wealth. We, we aspire to be wealthy, both of us. Amen. We, we are not prosperity teachers. I'm not going to be talking to you about prosperity as it relates to natural things. I want you to know if you understand that if you become prosperous spiritually, it has to follow you naturally. Because true prosperity happens spiritually first. The scriptures uh, uh, back that up. It tells us to be in health and prosper even as our soul prosper. Yes. And we'll get that scripture for you um, so we won't just be quoting things out the air. But I say that to say the kingdom is not material. It's not me with a new band. It's, it's not me with a mansion. You'll hear people talk about God bless me. Yeah, he might have blessed you with that. But the blessing is not the thing. It's the journey, it's the relationship with the one who blessed you. It's Christ. That's the true riches that we got to understand. It is not material. The kingdom is not material. I can't say that enough. Don't let the world fool you in thinking because they have a Bentley, they have a mansion, they have this, that they bless. The devil can bless too. Believe me when I tell you that. So don't spend your life chasing wealth if you haven't first yielded and submitted yourself to Christ. So we're talking about the process of old thing becoming new. We represent that old thing in Christ is that new thing. Brock, you got the scripture? Yeah, that was uh, 3 John chapter 2, verse 2. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospers. I told y'all we're going to give y'all a lot of homework. So this ain't going to just be us talking. Y'all going to have to do some investigation about what we're saying. Y'all going to have to look at God's word so that you can prosper. This thing works. So the process of old thing becoming new. We are that old thing. And in order to become new, we must understand that new thing is spiritual. Mm. We have to die to old things, the, the, the carnal parts of who we are. That's why I was talking to you about your habits, which you're eating. That's carnal. It's needed. It's necessary. But when you don't have the proper perspective, just like anything else, it becomes unbalanced. So what do you need in order for a old thing to become new? First, you need a willingness to change. Hmm. I ain't got nothing deep for you. It's real simple. A willingness to change. You need a separation from old, the old lifestyle 
and the people, places, the things associated with that old lifestyle. Mm. Romans 12 and 1. I'm going to give you some scripture. I want you to read it in your time. After you click off of this podcast, I want you to read these scriptures. Um, I'm not going to have Brother Brock read them all. I want you guys to read them. Romans 12 and 1. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Psalms 1, verses 1 through 2. Proverbs 13, 20. Proverbs 4, 10 through 14. 2 Timothy 2, 22. I can hear somebody say, that's a lot of scripture. <laughs> I told you it's a process. Now, if you want a magic wand, this is not the magic wand show. If you want reality and if, if you want to hear somebody tell you the truth about how a thing really happens, it takes time to get to be established in the kingdom. No question. It's not you no know, overnight. You heard the term overnight success. It doesn't, ex it, doesn't exist. It doesn't exist even in the world. No. And it certainly doesn't exist in the kingdom. And so, Brother Brock, you want to expound on any of that? You know, it's <clears throat> interesting that you, you mentioned, you know, Romans 12, because when we first began, the first thing I wrote down was Romans 12 and 2, when Paul spoke about being ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And the ing, the I-N-G, speaks to a process. You know, we spoke about uh, we're not prosperity preachers, but I've been called before a progress preacher, because if nothing else, the Word of God should be progressive in your life. At least it should be in all of our lives. And part of that progress comes through, in, comes through the process of renewing our minds. So we go back to talking about food or resolutions. Okay, we shouldn't necessarily need resolutions. But if you want to use, I mean, God gave us a count. If you want to use a date as a benchmark or the threshold for initiating a new thing, great. But don't, don't under, misunderstand you that we all must be continuously transformed by renewing our minds. We're not wanting to renew our minds about this thing, about our food, about our weight or anything. We're likely just falling into a religious social practice of resolutions. But what are you resolving to do? Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And through that renewing process, progress, in my mind, my experience, is inevitable. And so Brock is in the spirit because that's the next bullet point. First bullet point was a willingness to change. And I gave you the scriptures associated to that i said a willingness to change is a separation from old the old lifestyle people places and things the second thing is renewing your mind yes. now i have a willingness to change yes. i'm ready to renew my mind and it and, and it's the process of uh beginning to feed your spirit Reading the word, praying, fasting. And Brock gave the scripture, Romans 12 and 2. That's the first scripture. Then you have uh, Luke 4 and 4. Mm. 2 Timothy 2 and 15. And uh, as it relates to fasting, Brock, look at Matthew. You were about to pull up the scripture. Pull up the scripture you were about no, to pull up. Matthew 6 and 16 Matthew 6, 16 through 18. Let's see what that says. Uh, I think that's in regards to fasting. Um, let's look at that. Matthew 6, 16 through 18. All right, it says, Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with the sad countenance. For they disfigure their faces, that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you that they have their reward, but you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your father who is in the secret place and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And I can hear your thoughts. I don't even have a, a desire for the word. You talking about fasting? <laughs> and so I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I'm picking you up. So here's, here's the thing. I'm going to give you a tool. I'm going to give you a nugget. The great Bishop Kenner says, if you ever want to be successful in the things of God, you have to stop praying about them. 
Mm. One of the things he says is, if you don't have a, a desire for the word, that's not unnatural. Do this. Pray. God, give me a desire for your word. Yep. Give me a desire to pray. Give me a desire to fast. Why do I need to do that, you say, Brother Curtis? This is why. You are a old thing rooted in the earth in the old ways of doing things, the old ways of seeing things. In order to see things like God, you're going to have to start practicing kingdom principles. Mm. Listen to me when I tell you, don't expect kingdom results if you're not practicing kingdom principles. My Lord. You can't expect to be blessed by God doing things your way. So God's way is there are eight things that will ensure Christian growth. That's the word. That's prayer. That's fasting. That's praise. That's worship. That's giving. That's paying your tithes and going to church. Mm. If you're doing these things, I guarantee growth in Christ. Now, these might not help you if you want to become an accountant. But if you want to grow as a Christian, you have to be doing things that are conducive with the life you chose. How counterproductive and intuitive would it be for me to choose a life and then do everything contrary to the life I chose? So if I chose to be married and every night I'm going out to the club, leaving my wife at home, I made a counterintuitive choice. I chose to be committed, but I'm still acting like I'm single. And so the process of an old thing becoming new is this. If I truly want to become the new thing, the spirit thing, then I have to do things associated with the spirit. You have to read the word. You have to pray. You have to fast. You have to worship. You have to praise. You have to give. You have to pay your tithes. You have to come to church. He said, hold on, Brother Curtis, you're taking me too fast. That's why I said it's a process. I'm just giving you all the steps. <laughs> How you take them, when you take them is all up to you. But if you are truly to be successful in the thing that we're talking about, the process of an old thing becoming new, these are imperative. These steps, you cannot neglect one of them. And so... We have to begin to feed ourselves spiritual things if we expect to grow spiritually. If I want to stay the old, old man, all I have to do is continue to do what I did before. But if I want to become new, then I have to do something new. Brother Brock, you guys want something you want to expound on? Yeah, and you know, I, I, it reminds me of, I, I was trying to share some of these ideas um, sometime last year with a more secular audience in a business environment. And I spoke to them about actions, practices, and a lifestyle. So Brother Curtis speaks about the things we do if we want spiritual benefits. Uh, let me add that those things have to at some point become a lifestyle. Yes. For many of us, they start off with singular action. If I first come into the fold of the kingdom and I'm told to give, that giving may not be in faith. That giving may just be an agreement for an action for the moment. And God accepts that and rewards that according to my faith and understanding. At some point, though, that action must grow towards a practice that I do continuously so I'll begin to see the benefits and get the rewards from it. And I believe God rewards the compounding effect of, or the law of nature rewards the compounding of a thing. But at some point, to call yourself what this is, it's a part of your lifestyle. If you're an athlete and you say that you're an athlete, at some point, practice must be part of your lifestyle. I mentioned Al Nives and talking about practice. You're talking about practice, yes. Practice is needed. And it reminds me of a conversation where we're talking about comfort killing. And I remember, I remember praying about this, going to a meeting with some executives and thinking about how do I get these people to understand that we cannot do what the be spiritual things or natural things. We cannot do what we most prefer to do and get the outcome we most prefer to have. It just doesn't work that way. And the Lord gave me comfort versus strain. Mm. And in comfort versus strain, it reminded me of most of us desire and seek comfort, but we also desire and seek 
things to be either stay at the status quo or to grow. Well, the law of nature says that all living things are either one of two states of existence. They're either growing or they're decaying. Mm. You look anywhere in your life, and the example I gave was of a tomato plant. I planted a tomato plant outside of my house, anywhere. If I tend to that tomato plant, if I, if, I, if I till the ground, if I plant the seeds, if I put the water in, that tomato plant will begin to grow, begin to grow. And to some eyes, the growth process may appear to be natural and innate. But what happens the moment I stop tending to that tomato? I start going towards comfort. I don't feel like it anymore. I don't want to water anymore. I don't want to make sure no pests or no bugs are eating away that tomato plant. What's the most inevitable thing? What's naturally going to occur? It's going to begin to decay. So I reference back to comfort versus strain. Comfort never leads to growth. Comfort never leads to achievement. Comfort never leads to the things we desire to have in our lives. Only through some degree of angst, of strain, resisting our flesh, resisting our old mind, resisting our old sex, the renewing process can create some degree of resistance in our lives. And if we don't open ourselves up to the resistance process for the benefit of the renewing, for the benefit of progress, we can have our comfort. We're going to end up comfortable in the blessings of yesterday. We'll never be able to get ourselves into the blessings available for us today and to tomorrow, whether it be spiritual or natural things. The laws of nature just don't change when it comes to this. And, man, that was so good. And you talked about the law of nature. Who's setting in motion the laws of nature? Mm. God, with his sovereign voice. Author the universe gave a thing a commandment and it's been yep. operating the same way for thousands of years he only had to tell the sun once one time what to do he only had to tell the moon what to do one time he only had to tell the seas where the where its borders were and they operate in the law of nature so if nature is operating and responding to the order of God just imagine what could happen to us if we yield our <laughs> vessels to what he has said if you need to go to your window right now and look up I don't care where you are look up at the sky you say it's cloudy tonight you say it's raining you say just look you got a sky to look at Look out front. Look at the tree. Man, listen. This guy, God, this guy Brock just, just talked about is amazing. It reminds me of a conversation Brock and I had off air. And I began to tell him, um, you know, what he already knew about who I am. You know, I, I'm very simplistic. I'm like this. I'm not coming to church, reading the word, or any other thing if there's no change. Hmm. To me, it I rather I just might as well stay in the world. And Brock began to tell me about, uh, explain to me that people come to different places for different reasons, and the change they seek is a ch a temporary change rooted in what the environment environment makes them feel at the moment. But they're not talking about life-sustaining change. No. And what Brock just explained was a system rooted in discipline yes. that yields results. And so, in other words, faith without works is dead. We can't just talk this thing. We got to live this thing. Yes, sir. It's got to be something that you put into practice. And I like what he said. This has to be a lifestyle. This can't be something that you just talk about. This has got to be something that you implement and put into practice. Brother Brock, you wanted to say something else? You know, and, and I'm stirred up again here because I'm reminded again of this lesson. And if, if anyone listening to this, this doesn't make sense. The idea of I got to do all that. Then to me, don't feel any guilt because honestly, I'm not sure that I've always known this. I think many of us grow up in the world believing that 
There's a such thing as overnight success. Believing that we were told that if you if you walk or run, you'll be healthy, and we go walk or run like, okay, get on the scale. I ain't lost two pounds yet. It doesn't work there. A lot of us don't understand the laws of God, the laws of nature, and how things work. Another thing I mentioned some last year talking to some clients, did a free meeting, and I'm sitting in my heart, and I'm like, man, people have very good intentions. People intend to lose weight. People intend to be good husbands. People intend to be good parents. People have great intentions. Why do we so often fall short? Why do none of us seem to have the lives or the things in our lives we seem to pursue? And I was reminded to think, because we're not giving the appropriate attention to our intentions. Mm, we may write good. the vision and make it plain, but once the vision is written, how much of our energy how much of our attention, how much of our strain are we given to these sincere intentions? We sincerely want this. We sincerely want to be good. We sincerely want things, but we don't understand the power of resistance. We don't understand the resistance is also natural. We forget to give consistent, compounding attention to our so sincere and genuine intentions. That's what you're going you're gonna to hear Brock repeat that. Faith comes by hearing. We're going to hear a lot of the things we say repeat it because if the more you hear the more you can digest and understand but what he just said was so impactful and powerful if you can just get that little piece in your spirit because at the end of the day how do good intentions carry over to be good results mm -hmm. it's a process of correct practices yes. And whatever it is that you're trying to approach, in this case, we're talking about spiritual growth. We're talking about a process of an old thing becoming new. In order to get the intended result, you're going to have to do what it is we said. So far, we covered two bullets. The first being a willingness to change. Second, the renewing of your mind. Third, and here's the killer, live holy. <laughs> Dun, dun, dun. Live holy. What does that mean? Right living is a weapon against the enemy. And it brings favor of the Lord. Hmm. Now watch this. Brock just talked about resistance. And we know resistance in uh, when you're working out can build muscle. Resistance in this case is the adversary. He is determined that in this process of an old thing becoming new, that you stay the old thing. So don't think it strange when you are trying to get away from old movements, behaviors, and habits that these old people won't show up. The Domino's man come to your door with a free pizza. Somebody come over your house with a whole box of wine and you trying to stop drinking. All of these things will are bound to happen because you have an adversary. Mm. Remember, I told you this. The weak link between you and God is your flesh. Mm. That's the old man. The process of the old thing becoming new. That's the weak link. The enemy is going to use that as a door or a gate to come through to impede the process of an old thing becoming new. You have to be aware of this and you have to know this. So the third bullet is live holy. Hmm. Right living is a weapon against the enemy and brings the favor of the Lord in a time where super, super hyper sexuality on tv i'm not oblivious to it you're not oblivious to it uh it is a deterrent to living holy uh this world the bible calls us to be in it but not of it but guess what this world is not conducive for holy living living holy no it's not but guess what we have help, brothers and sisters, mm. in the word. Leviticus 11.45. Let's look at that, Brock. Leviticus 11.45. We're going to look at these three scriptures. And then we're going to see if we can help you a little bit. Leviticus 11.45. 
For I am the Lord who brings you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. He's saying, be like me. Yes. Remember the game, follow the leader? He said, I need you to follow me. Paul told him, follow me as I follow Christ. Be ye holy, for I am holy. Mm. That's why he can mandate we be holy, because he is holy. You'll never see Christ ask us to be anything that he has not himself already done. Mm. Leviticus 11.45. Let's look at Psalms 84. Let me 11. add one thing yes, to hold you. You know, it's, it's interesting. I was just reading recently, actually, a book, again, by Dr. Miles Monroe. Um, not familiar with him. Most of his writings and teachings are pretty on point. In this book, I believe it was The Purpose and Power of Prayer. And he went into a definition of the word holy trying to uh, actually extrapolate from this same verse. And he mentioned, I forget one of the, I guess, the original Greek or Latin words that holy came from and how that word meant one. And what he went on to say was, is that being holy means to be one. So what does that mean? God and his word is one. What God thinks, what God does, and what God says lines up. So for you and I, looking at that word, holy means to be one. Our thoughts and our words must be one with our actions, which means it must be congruent. In a teaching I was at a few years ago by a business coach, he spoke about by one of the reasons why a lot of entrepreneurs, salespeople, teachers or leaders in, in any regard, why we don't garner the results in our practices, our ministries and our jobs and so forth, because we are incongruent. What we say we believe, and what we do don't line up. They're incongruent. We aren't one. We aren't holy with our actions. We aren't whole mm, with what yeah, we think and good. what we do. So I wanted to add to that because for me, I'm one I like definitions. The definition of a thing, being holy sounds one. I understand it in terms of what it says. But to know what it means to be holy, for my mind, it helps me understand that I must, if I say I'm a Christian, then I must define what it means to be a Christian. And then my actions and my behaviors must line up with what Christianity is. And therefore, my actions are holy. My thoughts become holy. My actions become manifestation of what I know to think, what I know to say. So be ye holy, for I am holy. Being holy means be one. Be in congruence with the words you believe and the life that you live. Yes, sir. That's good. H-O-L-L-Y. Holy. And then I saw the word whole. Mm. W H O L E. Yes. So when I'm when I'm being when I'm when I'm imitating the word and being holy, I'm really becoming whole, one with God, yes. a connection with God. I like that, man. Yes. That's that's awesome there. And then the next scripture we're gonna look at is Psalms eighty four eleven. Psalms eighty four eleven. And here we are. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Uh, uh, uh. No good thing. Say, that, say it again. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Bless the Lord. Now think about it. If you're trying to become a new thing. Now, that's shot worthy. God is not going to withhold you from becoming a new thing. Mm. He said, no good, no thing. good thing. Hallelujah. He said, no good. Now, he said, I'm going to give you a good thing. I'm going to give you a <laughs> new thing. I'm not going to withhold that from you. If you walk upright, if you walk one, holy with my word. Yes. Leviticus 11.45. You yes. see the marriage and the correlation with, uh, with the word, how one just intersects with the other. No good thing will I withhold from you. You ain't got to make a New Year resolution. Like Brock said, if you want to use it as a marker, okay, I'm going to use at the end of the year uh, a marker to look back on the, the year to see what I accomplished, what I didn't accomplish, and I'm going to move forward. Hey, that's cool. Be but, but listen, this word is so good. You don't even have, it's not necessary. The whole goal that I want to achieve with this podcast is knocking out ridiculous behavior that is impeding what we really said we're trying to do <laughs> habitual ridiculous behavior me and brock were talking offline about 
people are so sick of people that have the talk down. Uh, my Lord. But the lifestyle stinks. My Lord. We want to be a podcast in reverse. We want to have the lifestyle lifestyle down. We might not have the talk down, but we we're going to have the walk down. We want to be holy. And so at the end of the day, I don't want to have all these eloquent words. I know how to orate. I know all the definitions to everything. And I ain't living nothing. Hmm. I want my lifestyle to be pleasing to God because he told me, if your ways please me, I'm going to bring you favor before man. And he said, again, if your ways please me, I'll even make your enemies be at peace with you. I want that kind of favor. Mm. And so the last scripture, Psalms 84, he said, no good thing will I withhold from you if you walk upright. It's conditional, though, if you walk upright. Yeah. And last scripture, Galatians 5 and 16. I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Listen, brothers and sisters, this is is very easy. We, we would have to we, we would have to really, really try hard to mess that one up. I mean, <laughs> the flesh has all kind of desires that's contrary to the spiritual life that we're trying to develop. And for each of us, it's different. So the Bible says, listen, deny those those desires, those pull, deny those things. But he said, the way you do it is you walk in the spirit and those lustly, uh, lustful fleshly desires won't have a hold to you if you're walking in the spirit. It can't hold you. And so that's why this is a process, because this is not something that is natural to us. Not at all. You got to remember, we're all flesh. Right. Why is that significant? Jesus was all spirit and came down in the flesh and did this. We're in reverse. We're all flesh trying to do this in mm. the spirit. See, we don't know anything about righteousness. He's teaching mm. us about righteousness. Our righteousness is as of a filthy rag. Mm. That rag they're referring to, I need not yeah. even mention to you. My Lord. And talking about the rag that is used by women when they come on their cycle. That's a that's a filthy rag. Mm. That's the rag he compared our righteousness to. Mm. And so I said that to, I say that to say the Bible says we are carnal. We don't understand about righteousness. We don't get it, but we have somebody that's willing to teach us. Our righteousness is as of a filthy rag. The Bible says we don't know how to we don't know how to do good. We we we're evil in our intent in our hearts because we're flesh. And so at the end of the day, we got to remember. He's trying to impute. He's trying to uh, teach. He's trying to help us understand spirituality and righteousness as he defines it, not how we define it. And so Galatians said, walk in the spirit, walk in the spirit. So you won't, won't even try to satisfy the lust of the flesh. It, you'll be immune to it. And you walking in the spirit, you won't have no carnal desires when you walking in the spirit. I know I, I've tried that. I, I know for sure. And so I want to bring some cl kingdom clarity as we close. I want to pose a thought to you. Death two ways. Mm. The first way. Self-gratification. Go ahead. Do what you want, when you want, how you want. Eat yourself to oblivion. <laughs> Here's the trick what the devil wants you to do. He wants you to do as thy will. Have your fun. Eat yourself into a diabetic coma eat yourself into cancer eat yourself into a heart attack go ahead 
It feel good, do it. Tastes good, do it. He doesn't want us to have any self-control. Here's the trick, brothers and sisters. You die once from overeating, out of control, and then you spend eternity in hell. Because you overate, you were in a lifestyle of sin, the enemy tricked you out of your eternal inheritance. Because the assumption is that you died and you wasn't saved. Now here's the second death. You decide to forego the pleasures of this world to live again. So you deny your flesh, self-denial, and you die a a a a physical painful uh death because you don't indulge in the things of the world but when you actually die and go out of here you spend eternity with the father because we're supposed to be in it but not of it and so what i'm proposing to you as we close is it's no magic wand this thing is not going to be easy but he reminded us that we can do all things through christ who strengthened us but i want to encourage you because i don't want to sell you a ticket that is not rooted in truth one thing that's guaranteed to all of us we're gonna die <laughs> so i just don't want you to do it being led by the devil and miss eternity because you living it up now. Whether you eating yourself to devil, eating yourself to death, smoking yourself to death, whatever it is that you overindulging in, it's bringing a temporary comfort. And enemies wants he wants to distract you from what the real purpose is. The real end game is eternity. Where will you spend eternity? And if you find yourself in a backslidden state. If you find yourself in a state where you're saying, I don't even know if I'm saved. Hey, you caught us on the right episode. Guess what? Every episode is going to be the right episode. <laughs> because our goal is to help shake and wake up the brothers and sisters in Christ who have fallen asleep through comfort. The comfort killing. We come to wake you up. Say let's go through this process of an old thing. Becoming new. How did we get here? Why are we here? And so. As we close. I want to give brother Brock. The floor to give some closing thoughts. And uh, further expound. We um. We run long. To some degree here. I just want to say that. I know I speak for us both. When I say that. Whoever you are, wherever you are, we love you. We love you as Christ loves you. We know that Christ first loved us. We're two men married most, if not all, of our adult lives, recording this show at midnight on a Friday while our wives are laying down in bed. We have other places we could be. But it's because of the love of Christ and the salvation we received that we have committed our hearts and our lives to do that which the Lord wills us to do. With that being said, if you are listening to this episode, this podcast, whatever you qualify it as, then I believe for one that you have the appropriate, that you have holy intentions. And with that, then we just simply are an aid with the word of God, with the anointing of God to be an aid for where to assign the appropriate attention. And if this show was recommended or referred to you and you don't have holy intentions, you don't know the spirit of God, you don't have right intention, but you find yourself in a place where there's chaos or turmoil in your life and a friend, someone who has the right intentions for you, sent you here. Then we're here to help offer hope to you and help you understand that there are better intentions for you. And it wants your heart in the line with the appropriate intentions. We again are aid to help. 
fix your thoughts, your mind, and your atmosphere on the appropriate attentions. That's all I got. With that said, we're going to seal this one with a prayer. Father God, you th we thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for who you are. We thank you, Father God, because you understand how to take an old thing and make it new. Yes, Lord. You understand that process. God, I thank you right now for those who are hearing this. I thank you for our lives, and I thank you for our purpose. I thank you for the opportunity to know you yes, Lord. and fellowship with you and to journey with you. God, we love you. We thank you. We give your name glory, honor, and praise. Touch the hearts of the hearers. God, let them see with your eyes, hear with your ears, and understand with your heart. God, we thank you. We love you. Give your name, glory, honor, and praise. Brothers and sisters, if you're hearing this, please, we we, we welcome you to uh, contact us via email, Facebook, Twitter, uh, for show ideas, your comments. Um, you need not apply if you want to come with negativity. We're just going to block you. But if you're ready for this new process, process, if you're ready for this new life, we are here to be uh, assistants uh, for you. And as always, in ending the show, we want to remind you to count your blessings and not your problems. Once again, I'm Brother Curtis. And I'm Brother Brock. Be blessed.